Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. And uh, I'll just make note that we are recording this session. And um, Amber Summers Graham will uh, maintain the recording. She will at some point here put in the chat her contact information. And uh, you could access the recording from her if you're um, unable to stay for the whole time today or if you would like to see that. Uh, Kessa, maybe you'll remind them again later uh, for Thank those you. who are latecomers. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. My name is Alan Smith. I am the Emma Eccles Jones Endowed Dean and also a professor of kinesiology and health science here at Utah State University in the Emma Eccles Jones College of Education and Human Services. Uh, as many of you know, we have a new president, uh, Elizabeth Cantwell, who in her first three months has spoken frequently about the importance of USU being a land grant institution for the 21st century. This includes our traditional focus of making education accessible to all citizens of our state and thinking toward the future as it relates to technology, innovation, environmental stewardship, and producing not only the next generation of workers, but of ethical leaders who will enable our communities to flourish. As we pursue progress and prosperity for our future, it's important to embrace the assets of our rural communities and consider how higher education institutions like Utah State University can meaningfully partner with rural communities to enrich lives through education and the promotion of health and well being. Our event today, held during our Education and Human Services Week at USU, allows us to hear from experts on education, health, and wellness in rural communities. We have superintendents of rural school districts, education and well being scholars from Utah State University, and leaders of rural education centers outside of Utah on our panel today. They will discuss challenges, assets, and possibilities for collaboration with rural communities in meeting the full promise of the coming decades. I'm deeply grateful to each of our panelists for participating today. Uh, thank you. And um, I know that our moderator will uh, give them opportunity to introduce themselves shortly. Let me now introduce our moderator uh, and then pass the proceedings to her. Our panel today will be moderated by Dr. Jay Kessa Roberts. Dr. Roberts is an assistant professor in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership uh, within the Emma Eccles Jones College of Education and Human Services here at Utah State. Utah State. Prior to working Prior in higher education, Dr. Roberts Dr. worked Dr. in rural Roberts schools in rural as a district-wide district super, 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 excuse me, we need to mute somebody, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Um, Prior to working in higher education, Dr. Roberts worked in rural schools as a district-wide school psychologist, serving students from early intervention through 12th grade. Her scholarly expertise is on the intersection of education policy and leadership and prioritizes rurality, highlighting the strengths of rural schools, families, and communities, as well as addressing the very real challenges found in rural places. So I thank you, Dr. Roberts, for facilitating the discussion today, and uh, I'll turn over the proceedings to you. Great. Thank you so much, Dean Smith. Um, thank you for that uh, opening set of remarks as well as that kind introduction. Um, and overall, just thank you for your support of tonight's panel. So I am so excited for our panel this evening. Um, we have a wonderful group of panelists, um, both from around the state of Utah as well as across the country. And I think you will really enjoy um, and learn a lot from tonight's conversation. I'd like to also thank uh, Dr. Sylvia Reed, who is our Associate Dean for Accreditation and Undergraduate Studies. Dr. Reed will be monitoring our chat this evening and will be collecting questions for the Q&A session at the end of tonight's event. So as you have questions this evening throughout the event, go ahead and just put them in the chat and Dr. Reed will be moderating that chat and uh, feeding those questions back to us at the end of the evening. Um, and as, as uh, um, we've already mentioned this evening, we are recording tonight's event. So if you want a copy of that, just reach out to uh, Amber Summers Graham and her contact information is in the chat. And I'll, I'll record or I'll remind folks again one more time of that at the end of the evening. So in order to introduce our panelists this evening, I've asked them to uh, share with us their name, their institution and their role, as well as their favorite thing about working with or in rural places. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our panelists. Dale, if you can kick us off. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Dale Lamborn. I'm the superintendent of schools in Rich County, Utah. Um, and I think uh, for me, the, the favorite thing about working in rural setting and education 
is it lends itself very well to building relationships with students because you know them, uh, you know their families. And uh, I'm a little old school, but I think relationships are still a key to effective education. I guess that's uh, I'm next. My name is Steve Carlson. I'm the superintendent of Box Elder School District. And uh, we're over here just opposite of Dale. We're on the, the northwest corner of, of northern Utah. And we have a, a huge school district uh, uh, in square miles. Uh, I'm in Brigham City, population about 20,000, 20, 21,000. And but we do have rural schools out on the Nevada border and Snowville that have as few as five or six kids. And then uh, Park Valley has 30 students. And then also Snowville Elementary that has 30 students. And so my favorite thing is just getting a chance to go out and, and visit with those folks and, and watch how exciting it is. We just did a nice thing uh, this last year or two. We, we rebuilt uh, Grouse Creek Elementary that has six students. And I got uh, some really neat cards from each one of those kids that said, thank you, Superintendent Carlson. And, you know, I've got to share that with the board because it's the board that provides that. But it's really awesome to get to see those kids excel. And, and even though they're so far away from what we'd call a mainstream, they really can excel and do great things out there. Hi, my name is Marilyn Kutch. I'm Hunk Papa Lakota from Little Eagle, South Dakota. I am originally from there, but now I call the UNA Basin my home, and I am teaching from Roosevelt at the Roosevelt campus. And one of my, um, in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership, I also direct the secondary education program for our department. One of the main reasons why I enjoy being out in rural America is because at the heart of our land grant mission, we're outreach in, in our areas in Utah to really help increase the number of educated Utahns. And I enjoy seeing people in my community come through our program, and then they're also teaching my children. So it's a, it comes about the circle, uh, so to speak, but it also speaks highly to what we're trying to do for our land grant mission. So thank you. Hi, I'm Courtney Flint. Uh, I am a professor in the Department of Environment and Society and the College of Natural Resources here at Utah State University in Logan. And uh, I consider myself to be a community and natural resource sociologist. Um, and I, I love working with um, and in rural communities. And I think one of my favorite thing about them is that um, despite how ruggedly independent folks can be in rural places and and despite any conflicts or tensions that they might have in their communities, uh, when, when there's an urgent need, man, people really drop everything and come together to look after each other. And I really value uh, that quality that I very often see in rural communities. I also direct what's called, perhaps more relevant for this conversation, uh, I direct the Utah Wellbeing Survey um, and project where I partner with, I've partnered with almost 50 communities and city leaders around the state um, to collect data on the well-being um, and local perspectives of their residents from very small towns to very urban areas. And I've, I've loved working with um, our partners in rural communities. I'll just put the link to that project in the chat. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy price I am visiting you from Virginia Tech um, in Blacksburg, Virginia. I'm time zone challenged, um, but I'm here. <laughs> Two hours difference, but um, but I made it at 6 p.m., not 2 p.m. Um, anyway, I am a professor in the School of Education. Um, my background is in adolescent literacy and rural education, and I also am the founding director for the Center for Rural Education at Virginia Tech. Um, and I think my favorite thing is just possibility. Um, I spent the day with a childhood friend of mine whose family is originally from Mexico um, and they settled in Appalachia and we together applied for a grant from the Mellon Foundation called Montanitas Reimagined. And so we spent the day planning what we're going to do for a monument about our little mountains, our dear mountains, um, to create a living monument to retell and reimagine the stories of um, Latine Appalachians, um, which is an, uh, an undertold story um, in our region. And so um, that 
is directly linked to health and wellness because when those narratives are told and lifted up, um, it it really creates a space and wellness for people. So I think that's what I'm most excited about, at least today. I'm just I'm high on that and really excited to meet you all. Hi, everyone. I'm Spencer Clark, and I am the director of the Rural Education Center at Kansas State University. And I am also a professor of curriculum studies in the Department of uh, Curriculum and Instruction. And um, I've used this background picture to prove that Kansas is not flat. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't compare to Utah or Virginia in terms of mountains, but it's not as flat as everyone thinks. But um, I enjoy working in the rural um, context because as we all know, every rural town and area is really unique. And so it brings kind of interesting diversity and, and intersections. Um, and I think that really comes through in, in how um, each school and community kind of addresses school challenges. And that's a lot of the work we do through the center. And, and it's always just amazing to see the innovation that comes from that, right? From, from just dealing, you know, using the context they're in to deal with the challenges that that they're that they're facing in their schools, and so it just makes every day and every time we work with a new school really exciting. So, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much to our panelists. So, when we talk about rural places, so often we have this tension between wanting to highlight and showcase the assets and the strengths of these places while also not ignoring the very real challenges. And so, this is the balance we're going to try and walk tonight a little bit of talking about both sides of that coin. So the first question I have for you are: is what are the most pressing challenges for rural schools and communities as you see it? And folks can feel free to answer in any order they'd like. You know, I I, I went first before, but uh, I think the challenges in rural education uh, are somewhat unique, but not totally unique from the, the challenges facing all of education right now. Uh, it seems to me that uh, education has become kind of a political place where people are wanting to play out agendas and, and push philosophies. Uh, a lot of times, I think those are counterproductive to uh, what's good for students. Uh, we become kind of a, a target for some political things. So I think that's a challenge. Uh, I think the other challenge that uh, we see is, is trying to make education uh, very relevant for students. Um, <clears throat> a personal uh, bias that I have is over the last many years, uh, we have allowed education to be equated with the only thing that it's good for is getting a job and making money. And, and I think the breadth of education and a well-rounded education has lost a little bit uh, over the last few years. And therefore, especially in rural communities, when students sometimes have opportunities to immediately jump into to jobs and make good money, uh, whether it be in the oil fields in our area or the coal mines in our area, uh, they they sometimes see, well, I can leave here tomorrow and make good money. So what's the value of education? I think pointing out that there's a lot more value in education than just making money is a challenge, somewhat unique to rural, but to all of education. Um, I, I jump in right now. Uh, just, I think one of the things that, you know, concerns concerns me being in a district that has such a, a wide range of, of different sizes of schools. If I look at the secondary experience, you know, um, uh, in, in Box Elder School District, we've got Box Elder High School that has 1,600 students. And then we have, um, our, we call them our Western schools. Grouse Creek is, is a K-10 uh, school. Uh, Park Valley is a K-10 school. And so in the ninth and 10th grade, everything that they, almost everything that they do is, is pumped in virtually from Bear River High School that's in Tremont. But if I look at what Box Elder High's uh, master schedule has to offer, you know, astronomy, just all the things that they have to offer versus what kids can get, everything has to be online. Then in, in those two schools that I mentioned, for the 11th and 12th grade, 
we actually provide a living stipend. They come in and spend their 11th and 12th grade in, in Tremont at Bear River High School. And they have to find a host family and, and we pay for, you know, the living expense. We pay for, pay for some, uh, some travel, but there's just, it's just hard to look at the master schedule and say that they have an equal opportunity with just the, the breadth of the type of things that we have to offer versus what they have to offer out there. So to me, one of those pressing issues is to try our best to give them as rich of an experience as we can so that they are able to explore and, and really be able to get a, you know, a, a huge passion as they do come in to Bear River High School. And a lot of our students, believe it or not, it's interesting. We have a lot of our students end up at Utah State University and, and are able to then, and they really do quite well. So it's pretty neat to look at it that way. I'll jump in. Oh, go ahead, Mama. You go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to piggyback on a couple of the topics that uh, we just heard about. Uh, as we know that in the past 10 years, 33 million immigrants have come into the United States. With that, we also have seen the diversification of many of our rural schools. And I think it's an area that we don't talk enough about. So as we're preparing teachers, we want to make sure that our rural schools have professionally licensed teachers in their content areas. However, we look at indig indigenous communities as some of the areas where they are sorely lacking in having access to teachers that are licensed at all. So that is an underserved area that I, I really believe strongly we, we need to work with. In the Uinta Basin, because of the relationship and the land-based location on the Uinta and Array Reservation, the Ute Indian tribe is uh, very much a part of our um, economy, how things are moving forward. And as we look across the, the entire state, we can see at each area we have tribal influences and tribal community resources that we're not using. We're not really tapping into for that community of wisdom keepers. So we see that our students are able to do a great deal online. However, does that fit into their worldview where they live in our rural America? So those are some of those, those challenges we have across the state. Yeah, I think one of the things that Spencer mentioned in his introduction is just how unique rural communities are from one to another. And, and I think from, from rural communities that are high amenity communities where there's juxtapositions of great wealth at, with uh, poverty among service workers that can't make a living wage, um, and, and to those rural communities that are somewhat urban adjacent and are experiencing tremendous growth, maybe as a bedroom community um, and, and schools feeling the pressure of all that growth. Uh, to some that are more resource extraction communities that are subject to boom and bust cycles in the economy, uh, there's just a lot of diversity across our rural communities. Um, you know, one of the things that I often hear that are uh, from rural communities is our, is our biggest export is our kids um, and not having trouble holding on to youth in the communities. That's one of the things. In our Utah Wellbeing Survey, there are a couple of things that um, from the, the 12 cities or towns from the 2020 survey that we have, we, we've got data that suggests that uh, personal overall well-being, mental health and physical health are all rated lower on average in our rural communities than the more urban communities. And some of the concerns that are statistically significantly higher in our rural communities uh, are suicide, substance misuse, uh, social and emotional support, opportunities for youth, access to quality food, access to health care, and that includes mental health care. So those are just some of the broader challenges, I think, in rural communities that I think find their ways into the, the school systems and because this is some of the back the con context in which the students are are coming from uh, in their communities and their families. And so while certainly not all communities are experiencing those things at the same level, uh, these are some of the things that we're learning from some Utah rural communities that are uh, some particular challenges. Yeah, Courtney, I would just add too that um, we're seeing that even in Virginia, a very similar pattern 
with our climate survey. So I just did a, a study where we looked at um, school safety and bullying from a middle school culture uh, climate survey from across the Commonwealth. And we found that the same, a very similar finding that students in rural areas had lower um, perceptions of safety and higher reports of bullying. And, and in fact, but the real the real takeaway from that study was that the more remote, the the higher those were. So the more remote, the more bullying, the more remote, the less perception, the fewer percep less perceptions of safety. Um, and we also found that the rural um, fringe districts had less in common with our distant and remote rural places than they like they had more in common with towns and suburbs than they did with those really remote. So I think another point that you made that Spencer picked up on too, was that when we have a question like about, you know, sort of challenges in rural that we're really starting to kind of look within rural and where is the, um, where are those differences within rural, whether it's Utah or, or Virginia um, or Kansas, but because um, I wrote down when I first heard that question, Kessa, um, like a zip code lottery, I talk about this all the time in Virginia. And, you know, it's hard to talk about equity in, in rural spaces without talking about that zip code lottery. And, you know, um, to, to Dale's point, like, you know, it just it might just depend on what offerings are at any school and um you know it's it's hard to build from that and i'll just close by sharing this one interesting fact that last week i was in chile um working with some scholars there who are trying to build gifted education programs in their rural schools and i was presenting to a university about some of these challenges that will no doubt come up in this conversation today and the dean of the school the college of education at this university said I would not have thought in a first world nation like the United States that you would have such, you know, structural and systemic um, inequity for your rural learners. And I felt um, self-conscious that I was like, you know, spreading some bad news globally. But um, but I said, no, we actually do structural inequality really well in America. Um, and unfortunately, our rural students are a case in point for that. And, um, you know, and if we can remedy that or puzzle that out in some way, that's really worthwhile work. Absolutely, thank you all. Um, what a comprehensive, I don't know that we touched on every possible challenge, but what a nice comprehensive set of challenges that you all presented for us to work with this evening. So thanks for laying that foundation so well. Um, as we think about challenges, so often, uh, I think Dale had said this earlier, you know, we, we it's not that challenges are necessarily fully unique to rural settings. They certainly have overlaps with non-rural communities, but often the amount of support or resources that we have at our disposal in rural places look quite differently. And, and the challenges might look similar, but the solutions by necessity often need to look quite different. So as we think about meeting some of these challenges, what um, kind of untapped or undertapped resources do you see in the rural places that you live and work with and any thoughts you have about leveraging those resources? <clears throat> well, I think uh, for Ridge County, uh, the, the undertapped perhaps, but the, what we have really tried hard to do is to tap into uh, resources around us. Uh, we've done a, a, a really nice partnership with Utah State University and Snow College for concurrent enrollment opportunities. So our kids, uh, the breadth, uh, Steve mentioned earlier, the breadth of curriculum, that used to be a huge problem uh, at Rich High School. And now because we can access uh, two-way audio and video, so uh, it's not just online, it's uh, interaction with, with very good professors, both at Utah State University and Snow College. Now the breadth of our curriculum has expanded significantly, which benefits us in so many ways, especially for students in their junior and senior year when they continue to be challenged in, in academic ways that we weren't able to to do before when it was just our teachers and our curriculum. Uh, so I think that partnership has been huge. We've also partnered uh, with Bridgerland Applied Technology College and, and have their programs coming in uh, to, to our school. And <clears throat> at Bridgerland has all of their curriculum on Canvas. So we're actually offering 
the exact curriculum that Bridgerland offers, uh, and therefore Bridgerland will accept the hours that students have uh, into their program in stackable credentials, and then Bridgerland's credentials stack with Utah State. So our kids are actually getting a, a, a big lift up there. The other thing, and I don't want to take too much time, but uh, I think it was uh, Courtney that uh, talked a little bit about the uh, social, emotional, wellness uh, things in, in rural America, or rural districts. That's been an area that uh, we were very weak in. Uh, we've made uh, over the last five years significant uh, resource allocation to to counselors. Uh, the other thing that uh, we did is is Bear Association of Government. Uh, all housed in Cache Valley, which is our our neighbor, and and I guess it's 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 urban to us, even though it's not really urban, uh, uh, has resources, but we weren't doing a very good job of of accessing those resources. So uh, through a grant through uh, the Family Place, we were able to get a liaison in Rich County that then becomes our eyes and ears to the various uh, opportunities and, and programs that are available in Cache County. And we're doing a better job. We've got to in, enhance that. But we're doing a much better job of being able to access the resources, both for kids and parents in our community. So for me, the thing that, that we have to do in, in rural education is to partnership with with places that have the services we need because we'll never do it on our own. Piggybacking with what Dale is talking about, partnering with local school districts is pivotal when it comes to educating your own community members. And we have worked in the Uinta Basin with Duchesne and Uinta County superintendents um, and the uh, human resources uh, and principal to create a paraprofessional program. And we looked at what the needs were that they saw for people who are currently in their schools as, as um, aides. And we found that there were a number of individuals that wanted to move into an associate's degree, eventually leading into a secondary or an elementary education license. And what was a good untapped resource that we found were people just needed training so that they understood their role even uh, more than just a support staff, but becoming that role of a professionally licensed teacher eventually. So we're happy to say that we're rolling out into other uh, rural counties. And this is another example of if you educate your community members, they don't educate themselves out of your community. And it also shows that the partnerships with the local school districts leads to stronger programs from our own um, uh, programs that are available already online. So we're, we're really excited about that. The other part I wanted to also bring in was that from an indigenous perspective, Having people at our campuses that know the culture, understand what is going on within our indigenous communities for celebrations, for unique needs of our students, and being a part of the active advising and the interest, initial interest leads to the graduation that we want. Just because you're taking classes, you want that terminal degree. So then you are staying in your position. You're, you're ready to be a teacher in your schools or even just being able to stay within Utah State University and finish that next degree leading to uh, your own professional goals. I think one of the things that uh, was mentioned earlier uh, was the the uh, emotional and mental health. Um, it's been a big concern of ours um, with uh, those students out there, and I, it's been surprising to me. You know where where our most rural schools are. We have people that will have problems with their kids in um, more urban setting, and then maybe send their children to grandma 
or grandpa or both. And they end up going from a, you know, an elementary or a middle school of 11, 1500, 1200 to a K-9 school uh, of 30. And the amount of different unique problems that has thrown at us. And there's a lot of the, 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 the bulk of those folks out West are, are, are cattle ranchers. And, you know, all of a sudden you've got a kid who grew up in, in maybe Ogden and it's a whole different thing. So UETN has been very helpful for us. Uh, we also have through grants through the legislature the last few years and the fact they've given us more counselors. We have a counselor, two different counselors that take turns and drive out there. And once again, from Brigham City, Grouse Creek is two and a half hours away. And so when they do that that day, it, it, it does cause quite a quite a problem. And so we've had to leverage, you know, and then once they've made the relationship in person, they then make sure that they're able to um, have time that they hook up on Zoom or whatever so they can talk to them on a more regular basis. And so we've we've tried to make sure that we give the emotional and, and uh mental health support out there that, that, that we can. And, but it, it is definitely, you, you know, it's, it's definitely an issue that we're very concerned about. And so I uh, appreciate, you know, all the programs we have. Uh, we haven't talked about it here. I assume in Utah, we have a program called the Necessarily Existent Small Schools Grant, and it's called, we call it NESS, but we get a fairly good chunk of money to help us run those schools out there and actually pay for the the you know the the day to day things the the general uh, uh, accounting of it and so I'm very happy for that and you know if anybody has a chance every year we always ask for more money and uh, our legislature's been pretty darn good to help us with those types of things. Yeah, I just um, I think in terms of some of the things that have been discussed here, you know, in terms of mental health and that overall well being. Two things that we found in the Utah Wellbeing survey, survey that are really strong correlates with higher levels of mental health and overall well-being. One of them is community connections, um, and and what we're finding is is in our, in our actually in our rural communities we have people who feel more strong connections to their their town or their city as a community, and and those people that have those feelings of connectedness. I have higher levels of uh, better, their better well, mental health, better well-being, and and incorporating those community identities and those community strengths into our service provision, um, tapping into uh, different assets that you might have throughout the community. They're usually in rural places. People actually really do care about where they live and the people that they live with, um, and in times of change or times of growth. Um, really focusing on how to build those community connections can be, you know, resources really well spent, but in turn, they become resources. Um, the the other um, thing we find that's really has a strong correlation with mental health and personal well-being is connections with nature. And in rural places, this is a, this is a resource that's just at their doorstep. They've got um, natural places. We find folks in rural places like to get out for either motorized or non-motorized recreation in public lands. Uh, and this is a real asset. And those opportunities for outdoor learning um, and just that improving mental health can, can be a, a resource. And I'll point to one of our partner cities, that, which is which is Helper. And what they've done is they've invested, they've really worked hard to get grants to build up their river corridor as a nice place to spend time. And they've also tapped into community members as volunteers and let people sign up for whatever it is that they're interested in, whether it's painting park benches or coaching a little league team or anything like that. And so community members themselves um, can be a great asset. And there's a great story in Axios today on uh, on Helper. Uh, and I think they're a really good example to other rural, rural communities about, about how to build these things that then support our mental health, support our overall well-being in our rural communities. Yeah, thank you so much, Courtney. As we think about both the challenges and kind of these untapped or underutilized resources. I'm wondering if we could talk just more specifically to drill down a bit for one of our most vulnerable populations of students, which are those students with our, with disabilities. And um, if we can just talk for a moment about kind of 
the challenges or resources that you see um, being most relevant to that particular group of students? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, Dale, you're muted. Sorry about that. I said, I've talked over Spencer twice, so I'm going to be quiet and let Spencer talk. Uh, Spencer actually had to step out. Uh, he had told us earlier he has a class right now that he's teaching. He's only able to join us for the first half of tonight. So take it away, Dale. <clears throat> um, obviously, again, it's it's the breadth of, of resources is very limited. I think uh, with our students with disabilities, again, uh, I think we do a really good job of, of building relationships with the students and their parents. I think that's a major positive. Uh, we know them well. We know them from the time they come in either preschool or kindergarten till they walk across the stage uh, at graduation. And so that continuity of services uh, is something that uh, is is very helpful. But we find, especially with uh, our our postgraduate students uh, that are still uh, receiving services through the district, uh, we have limited services for those students. You know, uh, work <clears throat> work opportunities, uh, community places that that lend themselves to to giving them opportunities is, is challenging. And we work hard to do that, but uh, it, it's difficult to, to meet those. So rural has some strength in terms of relationships and continuity, in terms of accessing outside resources, it has some limitations. Thank you. One of the things that we hear stories about is how difficult it is in some rural places and communities to actually get the, um, you know, the testing and the, the, the access to those diagnosed diagnostic tools and so forth that um, help get to a diagnosis, which then allows a student to tap into resources. And and there can also be a lot of stigma, um, probably particularly in the developmental um, dis disabilities, um, mental health disabilities and so forth. But um, there can be a real stigma in rural communities that can also be a barrier to people seeking out even the diagnostic testing that would then elevate them and enable them for an IEP or something like that. So we, we do hear some stories anecdotally um, that this is a this is also a particular challenge. Just the distance to have to go, much less overcoming that stigma, is is tough. And I think Courtney, to to speak to that, I agree with uh, what you're saying. The two things again, it's a partnership uh, situation. Is uh, Utah State University has been very good when we've needed to do testing. Uh, the district will provide. The resource, the financial resources, and and the travel if if necessary to get parents over there, and then we've also partnered uh, with Cache County School District, uh, and we bring their psychologist over for most of our testing, uh, just because uh, we feel like we get a a better read, we get a more uh, viable and reliable read. And, and we just, uh, if we were not for those two partnerships, uh, we would be in trouble, but uh, we're able to access them. But ge geographically, it's a problem because from Rich High School to Logan, 70 miles one way. So it's it's not without its challenges, but without the partnership, we would be in a much worse situation. Yeah, and I would just add too with the closures of rural hospitals across the country and some other things that we know are going on, um, there's a greater onus on the rural school then to provide those services. And um, I do a lot of work in rural gifted education. So looking at, ex at exceptionalities, you know, sort of broadly. 
And people will say, like, there's not a federal law that um, sort of protects uh, gifted education in any kind of real sense. It's state to state, and it's very varied across the country. Um, and people often say, well, you know, we have IDA, we have ADA, we have IEPs, we have 504s. And I'm like, that's great. But if you don't have a human being who's an occupational therapist or a speech therapist or someone who can do that diagnostic that Courtney's talking about, then that person, you know, like Dale's saying, you're 70 miles and that, that means that that family or grandfamily has transportation, can get the child there, you know, and maybe a school district provides that transportation, but it's just very difficult to do. So I guess the takeaway maybe for this audience would be that um, because the onus then becomes on the rural school and the child is often, because the resources aren't school-based, that the child under the guise of differentiation is put in a general education classroom. And many of our teachers who are working in rural schools have had one course in exceptional learners, you know, in their, in their um, coursework. And so they're just, it's, it's like piling a, a challenge on top of another challenge. And because those teachers become very quickly overwhelmed if they're to differentiate and you have different, you know, disabilities and exceptionalities in that classroom. So, you know, maybe we can think about at our different institutions where we are partnering, what can we do to better prepare those teachers for working with students with exceptionalities, for working with our multilingual um, students, um, and, you know, just across the board, thinking about diversity in rural spaces really differently, and also acknowledging that, you know, especially for those remote and distant places, you know, just because a law or a policy exists, to protect that child or to ensure certain, um, you know, access uh, to, you know, at least restrictive environment that could look really, really different school to school to school to school. Um, and yeah, I think that presents a huge challenge. And I'll just say one more thing about the gifted education for, from Kessa's last question about sort of that untapped resource. I think if we start to think differently also about talent development, you know, as a way to think about uh, community viability and sustainability in rural places as one of those untapped resources. Um, as we were saying before, you know, like, again, Courtney, I think you said that, um, you know, people tend to care very deeply about the places that they're from. And I think place is one of those unifying forces um, that helps us get past politics and stereotypes and rhetoric and all of that because there's a lot of investment in the places that we love um and so you know talent development even though it's very underfunded and under resourced um and i've had superintendents tell me like amy we got bigger fish to fry and i hear that um but also like sort of playing the long game for our rural communities and and realizing like if we want those resources to change and we want that speech pathologist to be there, then if those kids, you know, if we're not developing that talent from the start, you know, why would they maybe return to that community if they do leave and go to college? So it's just, a, a you know, again, like sort of thinking about it really broadly, what we can do long term. You know, this discussion has triggered some uh, even <laughs> more concerns than I had before talking about gifted and talented kids. Uh, it just made me think, um, we have an orthopedic surgeon right here in, in uh, Brigham City who, who just does a lot of great things. He's actually worked on this tired old body. And uh, he, he came from, from Park Valley, that school of 30 kids from K to, to ninth grade. And, and I'm sure, and I don't know if he was gifted. You know, to be a doctor doesn't mean you're gifted. But I now I have to go back and talk to my folks and say, hey, are we doing a good job of making sure that we're taking care of those kids that, you know, have, have those, you know, those uh, gifted and talented skills. So it's just made me more aware of some things. I appreciate being on this panel to be able to discuss that. So thank you. Yeah. Coming from a very small school uh, in Kansas, you know, that's, it's important for us to see our role in preparing the future leaders that are going to be in our communities. And thinking as an indigenous um, individual in the UNA Basin, I, I talk to other tribal people and they say, we don't want to educate our children out of our community. We want them to stay here. We want them to build um, on the culture and build into long-term businesses or opportunities for their children and their extended family. So I think one of the, the missed low-hanging fruits that we often forget about is actually remembering students can do internships in that high school. So if they are interested in becoming a teacher, 
um, the two counties that we have here, they have something called teaching as a pro profession, TAPS, and they are given opportunities to take the classes and go out into the schools to see what it's like to be uh, an early childhood elementary and then that secondary ed student, and they get that credit. So if we can do more of that with our students and, and really giving them the credit in that high school or even earlier into junior high, I believe that we will have that next generation of, of um, educators in our community rather than trying to go out and spending thousands of dollars every single year with human resources to go <laughs> do um, talk to people in West Virginia or in Wisconsin because it's great to live here. You can go skiing, you live in a rural area and they might not last more than a couple of years. So you've lost all of that money. Whereas you could have used that money to give incentives for uh, getting um, fully licensed and you're a community member, you're a paraprofessional, but you're here, you know the needs, unique needs of your area. And I know as, as an, as a, a teacher myself, that the earlier you get into that classroom, the earlier and the longer, then you're more prepared then. And you've got a mentor making sure that we've got great mentors that are there with our pre-service teachers early on. They're going to stay in that, that field longer than other people would. So I, I love it that we've got this great partnership here in the Uena and Duchesne counties with our TAPS program. And I know across the, the state, there are other examples too. Thank you all so much for that. You know, you've already all, most of you have already talked about this idea of partnerships and not going it alone and really um, embracing this idea of working with folks um, in the school, out of the school, in the community, um, university, et cetera. So I'm wondering if you can just spend a minute thinking and talking about what um, one partnership that perhaps you haven't cultivated or don't have access to um, would be most beneficial in supporting our children and families in rural places? I'll jump in and say that um, I think some communities um, really value their sort of partnership and their connection with USU Extension. Um, we have extension offices, of course, um, in, in all of the states. So um, if, I think extension can be a tremendous partner, um, not just in the education realm, but on substance misuse and on a lot of the issues, nutrition, et cetera, that uh, I think are particular challenges. So I think some communities may not be tapping into the, the benefits that, that the extension faculty and extension offices and specialists that can, can provide. So I would just put a plug in for that. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, probably where we've not partnered as well is, uh, and Amy, uh, highlighted this when she made her comments a few minutes ago uh, with the gifted end of things. We have not worked as diligently. And, and you could say, I guess, in some ways, our, our academically gifted uh, are able to do concurrent enrollment. So we're, we're doing that a little bit. But uh, for our students who are gifted in the arts and those kind of things, we do very, very little for those students. And, and probably that is an area where they have the very least exposure uh, in our county. Um, you know, if, if you wanna go to a, a play or a Broadway, you know, you've gotta to go to Salt Lake to either Eccles or uh, Hale. And, and most people just don't do that. Uh, we have limited, you know, we have some great ladies in our community that to teach piano up to a level and then that they're kind of done. And so uh, I, I have felt that guilt a little before and Amy poured some gas on the guilt. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome. I'm glad I could join you all tonight. <laughs> no, but I'll just say from my context though, Dale, I've heard that so often and you know, it's, it's election day today. And so a lot of our local schools are closed and it was a 
teacher develop like a professional development day. And so I actually met this morning with the gifted resource teachers in our local um, district this morning um, to talk about, you know, in our district, they want, it's a very, uh, it's a, we have a university town and then it stretches into very rural regions. Um, I'm in central Appalachia. And so our district looks really different school to school to school. And they're thinking about what can they do to create more equity? And I think your point is not missed. And I've heard it from so many superintendents because it's one of those things that's like, gosh, how do we prioritize that? And and I'll just tell you very quickly to kind of take some of that gas off um, is that, you know, there there's a way to there's a way to do talent development to get away from um, people kind of bristling at the idea of giftedness. Um, like, uh, Steve, you, you know, some of your comments were sort of like, you know, what, whether it's a doctor or whatever, like, well, what is what is that even mean? And I think we have often in our minds like Harry Potter or Hermione, let's say, use Hermione or a young Sheldon. We and we have this like idea of what we think that is. Um, but in our work, and I have 10 years of empirical data on this and, you know, $3 million in grants to prove it, that there's a way in rural schools, very remote rural schools, to develop a sustainable gifted education program by doing two things. And that's one, to have a universal screener where we're looking at all kids in that school and not relying on a referral program that typically only benefits kids um, who wouldn't have been missed in the first place or whose parents know a little bit about college or, you know, uh, dual enrollment or AP classes. Um, and then the second thing is once we do that is to use local norms instead of national norms. And so that becomes incredibly important. And again, there's a lot of validity behind this. Um, but, you know, I, I live in Virginia and in the northern part of Virginia, of course, there's Washington, D.C., and people refer, refer to that area as Nova for northern Virginia. And I often talk about how I'm from Rova, which is the rest of Virginia, which is looks nothing like D.C. or Nova. Um, and so when I'm working in southwest Virginia, which has a lot of historic poverty, um, I don't want to compare my kids in southwest. I don't want to compare kids in Rova to Nova because they've, ha they've had really different opportunities to learn. And no, they haven't had access to, you know, maybe the fine arts and the, you know, Kennedy centers and things that, that might be around in DC or Nova, but, um, but they have streams and backyards and, and caves and like lots of cool things in their environment. So just very different opportunities to learn, but often things that are not valued in the school curriculum in this very sort of generic decontextualized curriculum that we have in our schools right now for lots of different reasons. So um, by using those local norms, we're able to say, let's develop talent where it is. And who cares if it's not at a 96 percentile? Who cares? Like, let go of all of that and just develop that that top group of kids as you have it. And there's even pushback for that. You know, all kids are gifted. And while that may or may not be true, we still have to think about like, who's who's going to take care of Steve? You know, who's that future doctor? Who are those people that are going to be in your community who haven't just come, come there to pay off their loans? Who are the people that are really invested because they grew up there? And, you know, it's it's not a silver bullet by any, by any means, but I do think it's part of a solution for us as we think about rurality and, and rural futures. Amy, I uh, was reading an article today about the need for our teachers to have at least 30 different differentiation techniques for ELL learners. And our rural areas have pockets that are growing for ESL needs, ELL learn. And, and I really believe that those are very much in the same vein of, of our gifted and our, our talented learners. So an area that I know we need to support their children, our families, are for our um, ESL, EL, ELLs. So that's one thing I just, I can't say enough about, um, especially here with our economy uh, and, and the UNA Basin, we can see it. And it is in our schools too, the diversification of rural schools in Utah. Absolutely. And Courtney, in talking about partnerships, I love that you brought up Extension because they are so often such an amazing partner for so many of our rural schools and communities. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, and Amy, if I can just ask you in particular, um, I would ask Spencer as well as another center director, but he had to, to leave for the back half of the discussion. But um, if you could just briefly tell us, thinking about those university partnerships, you know, we have Extension and, and that's an amazing resource. And then thinking about how your center in particular at Virginia Tech has been 
been a really invaluable resource to the community that, that you serve. So if you can just tell us briefly kind of what um, that has looked like or what kind of benefits the communities have gotten from you having that kind of center at Tech. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, we're so excited about our Center for Rural Education. Um, I kind of made the joke with the teachers this morning that, you know, no shade on Virginia Tech, but I don't know why it took 150 years for us to have a center because we're a pretty big land grant university here in central Appalachia. Um, but Courtney, one of the first things as we kind of cooked up this idea to um, to uh, charter a center, the first thing I did was reach out to Extension because you know it was really important for me as a faculty member to acknowledge that there are lots of people in this community doing really important rural work and Extension is at the forefront of that. They are in every county in Virginia and they are on the ground, that they know the kids and the communities. And so it was really important first to kind of like garner a lot of support from different entities at Virginia Tech. But it was one of the um, extension uh, faculty members here who said to me like, please do this because we need a hub of our wheel. And I think like that really gave me a sense of empowerment to um, found the Center for Rural Education um, here. And, you know, I think Kessa, in all kinds of ways, like, First of all, it signals to uh, our regional community, our larger you know, stakeholders across the state that there's a commitment at the university level that rural matters, that rural people and rural places matter to this institution. And that's hard to do just one faculty member at a time or even extension that's, you know, it's, it's, it's an extension, like it's, you know, it's important, but sometimes it's seen tangential to that university mission or it's, you know, it's just different. And so I think part of it is signaling and um, representing the university in that way. Um, at our center, our mission was to really think about um, equity, like we wanted to center that. And so the three ways that we're trying to think about our work is that we have K-12 initiatives, um, where we're really trying to partner with schools. Some of my work this morning would point to that. But our signature um, program is that we have a summer camp for rural students who come on. It's called CVT, so Summer Enrichment Experience at Virginia Tech. So we bring students from very remote rural communities and they actually come on campus. It's often the first time they've ever seen a college campus, the first time they've been away from home. Uh, we have therapy dogs who like greet them on the first night because it's pretty intimidating because it is a, is a pretty big campus. Um, and we expose them to all different types of the humanities and STEM um, careers, but it's all anchored by place and rurality. So what could these, we study the few nexus, for example, food, energy, and water, but what does that look like in their home community? So they study case studies about Appalachia or different rural areas in our region um, and kind of tease that out. What would that look like at home? Um, and we're starting a winter enrichment as well. Um, another part of our mission is to serve our faculty and students at Virginia Tech. And so we have internal grants that we were able to award um, to different faculty members, which was so key, again, being that kind of hub of the wheel, finding out I've I've been contacted by so many people who are like, hey, I'm a first gen or I grew up in this small rural place in Kansas. And I'm like, how'd you get to Virginia Tech? And so we've made all kinds of connections. And when we put out a call for that internal funding, we had somebody who was looking at the prison pipeline for rural families. They were looking at things like um, how to treat eating disorders and how that's different in rural communities. I mean, things I, that are so beyond my scope of scholarship. So it was really cool to be able to put funding toward that. Um, and then another signature piece that we're trying to do for students is we're trying to create an accelerated bachelor's degree so that rural students who come to Virginia Tech, we're trying to get apprenticeships back in their home community so that they don't just see college as a one way out, but that there's a, you know, a way back in as well. And we're also trying to establish a study abroad program for first generation rural students who often can't partake, partake in the full experience of being an undergrad. Um, but we're trying to provide some curriculum so that they deal with the tension of what that means to then grow uh, a global, you know, some some cultural capital, but out without losing social capital back at home. Um, and then finally, our third part of our mission is community engagement. And so um, Kessa was able to join us for our uh, Rural Education Summit this past August. And so it's our community facing events. We also have like a rural film festival. Um, and again, it's a lot of like signaling to the community that if a rural school district um, 
has a challenge, that they know we're here, that they know they can reach out to us, that they see us as true partners and those sort of like trusted community brokers. Um, so that's where I've really seen, you know, you know, and we're only a year and a half in, like we've been busy, but um, but like already I can see that sort of wheel in motion. And our last summit was also focused on community health and wellness. And it was so cool because we ended up talking to community service boards and like um, social workers. We did Narcan training because we have a, you know, the opioid epidemic is particularly pervasive here in our region. Um, we had Beth Macy who wrote, who authored Dope Sick was our community keynote. So again, I think it's like, there's, there's the work that we're doing, but then there's also the message that it sends to our partners when we say, oh, Hey, you know, Stephen Dale, like, hey, you're, you know, you're working in those schools in Maryland, like all of you are in these different places, but like, then you see us as a true partner because you're seeing that the university has put a commitment, you know, toward, toward those efforts as well. And it's really, I, I can't say enough about it. It's been a really amazing, um, ama an amazing year and a half. And we're just hoping that it just grows from here. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, just some excellent examples of what's being done around the country, in addition to, you know, some awesome things we're already doing here in Utah. And I think our conversation tonight, you know, just really focused on this idea of partnerships um, and this idea that the university is, is very much integral to those partnerships in so many ways, right? Whether it's extension, whether it's, um, you know, thinking about exposing students beyond curriculum wise, beyond what they're able to be exposed to in their home high schools um, and partnering with local universities in that way or universities around the state in that way. Thinking, Marilyn, about your point about preparing teachers to be in those spaces, right? And what are what is our responsibility at the university level to make sure that we are sending out qualified, prepared teachers to be in every classroom, including our rural spaces. So thank you so much for, for all of those thoughts. Um, we It's hard to believe, but we only have about 12 minutes left together. And I do want to make sure we get to at least one or two questions from the chat. So Sylvia, I believe you have a question or two pulled from the chat that you can uh, pose to our parents panel. And panelists, I would just say, keep in mind, we have about 12 minutes left. So uh, maybe keep your answers relatively brief for these uh, last couple questions. And I'll turn it over to Sylvia. I just want to point out that in the chat, Jacob Cameron, who works at our Sorensen Legacy Foundation for Clinical Excellence, he has posted a provider flyer for mental health services that offer a sliding scale for those with no to low income. So that's important. Thank you for posting that, Jacob. Um, we had a question um, about the mental health in rural areas, and this the questioner is asking, is it just the bullying, or are they seeing higher rates of youth suicide, or is it just lower levels of happiness? All of the above um, from my data. Um, it's it's pretty pervasive, and it, and it varies. The experiences can vary across different popul different ages and different demographic groups. So um, we do hear about bullying and, and sort of tensions in the social fabric that find their way into schools too. Um, uh, there are suicides, there's a lack of access, and there just looks that can be some lower overall, just general personal well-being, which is made up of so many different things, including happiness. So from our data, it's across the board. Thanks, Courtney. Dr. Carlson or, or Dr. Lamborn, do you have anything you want to add on that, what you see in your districts? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I would concur. Uh, generally, we see, you know, there's many problems and, and sometimes the bullying and the problems are because of the, the nature of the small town, probably go back to mom and dad getting bullied by the, that kid's mom and dad and maybe grandma and grandpa. And it, it really is more entangled than, you know, a, a bigger place where they, they don't have this generational issue. And, and some of it has to do with socioeconomics, but some of it is just the, the, the power structure that ends up giving bullies that strength. And so it is definitely a concern. We had, oh, go ahead, Dale, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> there was a, another kind of more specific question um, from uh, 
from Jake Downs, who's our science of reading professor uh, in new hire in the College of Education and Human Services. And Jake was wondering if you superintendents, have you been, how have you been working through the logistics of, of SB 127, the early literacy outcomes improvement? And is that impacted by the rural nature of your districts? Uh, one of the things that I haven't mentioned tonight is, is we also have, uh, a regional service center, uh, which services 11 of rural school districts uh, out in the basin, uh, as well as uh, Park City ourselves. <clears throat> but uh, we have utilized people out of the regional service centers to come and work with our teachers. Uh, and, and it's been very, very good. So we've accessed that professional development. Uh, we found time and and place to do that. And so I feel very comfortable that we've probably done as well with that as the Wasatch Front because the, the folks that have come out of our regional service center have done a great job with that. I, you know, um, just looking at it, we've talked a lot about it and we feel like, you know, we're fortunate that we are small enough in some of those areas that, that, we've been able to really work with those kids and, and this early literacy <clears throat> initiative is something that we've really taken a hold of and we're excited about it. Uh, we all know the statistics of reading at grade level by a third grade. And, and so we've tried to put more resources in from the, the district level and, you know, TSSA money. Uh, well, I'm talking Utah stuff here, but uh, those types of things, we've encouraged our, our uh, principals and teachers to take advantage of those to help those kids reach that initiative. Thank you. And I, I think our other questions have already been addressed because we had one question about students with disabilities and being able to attract or retain scarce and skilled staff who can serve those students. We, we kind of uh, mentioned that, more than mentioned it, uh, but if there's anything anyone wants to add. And then uh, Spencer put a comment in about using problem-based and place-based learning for teachers and connecting them to the community. So that's another point that was made. And now, um, yeah, and then there's this one about um, educating students so that they can choose between staying and thriving or launching out and thriving. And, and Courtney uh, answered that one too about educating them so that even if they do go away, then they want to come back and they bring uh, assets with them when they come back. So if, if anybody wants to comment on any of those, that's the end of the things that I'm seeing in the chat. And I would you know, just... I'd, I'd like to follow up uh, just a second on what Marilyn said earlier about uh, kind of growing your own. I think one of the things that uh, we've been successful at is students left Rich High School, go to their university experience, come back and, and want to live here. And because they want to live here, uh, they make great educators. And, and the other piece, especially at the secondary level, uh, that's it's a challenge is our secondary teachers teach a lot of different preps because we only have one science teacher. He teaches it all. So getting them endorsed in biological and physical sciences, asking them to do five or six preps during a day is difficult, but I keep telling them there's another side to that. You know, you know the, the total student population might not be as high as it is on the Wasatch Front and uh, some of the difficult challenges in terms of behavior are less. So it's a balancing act, but teaching in a rural district uh, is, is very difficult, especially at the secondary level. I just, uh, I'll mention, Dale, that we have a new science composite major that is being developed in the College of Science where people will, students will graduate with, to be qualified in three science areas um, with the level one science. Um, the level two would be, uh, would allow them to teach like AP and upper level courses, but so there was a depth breadth kind of conundrum there and both are still available. You can do it either this way or this way, but we're thinking that this being able to do three science content areas as part of a major um, will help our rural partners a lot. 
That's wonderful. Thank you. That is that is great great news. Uh, I will say one thing. I want to take a little jab at Dale for having some homegrown homegrown uh, teachers. Two of his daughters teach for me in the same elementary school up in Fielding, Utah. So I get to take a, a thank you, Dale, for preparing these young ladies that teach so well and do such a good job. I would just add one thing, Sylvia, to that question, because I've written a lot about using play space and critical place pedagogies, both in teacher preparation and also in the K-12 curriculum. And even at our summer camp, you know, where, uh, like I was saying before, a lot of our work is anchored around rurality and place. And then people say, well, you know, what if that kid doesn't want to live in their rural community? And I'm like, who cares? Let them leave, <laughs> you know, then they'll be this really educated person about rural spaces in those meetings in Nova or, you know, in Salt Lake City or wherever they go. Like, we still need that kid at the table whose time wasn't wasted, who learned about their community and learned about rural people and places and why it all matters, you know. And then, you know, sometimes when people have families, you know, their life, life, you know, it's in flux all the time. And then maybe they'll say, oh, no, maybe I do want to live at home. But I'm always like, go. And, you know, it's like the same college argument when people say, you know, well, college isn't always the answer. And I'm like, no, but it should always be a choice. You know, and I just think that th some of these conversations about talent development or um, place, you know, sort of is a is a is a really uh, helpful way to respond when we kind of get that pushback in our spaces. But, you know, even if they leave, you know, they'll leave being those rural advocates in different spaces, but maybe they won't leave and they'll come home and, you know, take care of us as we age, <laughs> as, um, as she was saying. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, panelists, I think we are about out of time. Um, so I'll just take the last uh, minute or so. And thank you so much. Uh, if we were in person, we would give you a round of applause. But we'll just, you know, feel free to use your emojis on your screen, audience, and you can, uh, you know, pay your respects that way to our panelists. But uh, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Um, so much to think about. Um, again, we did record tonight's session. So if you would like a copy of that recording, you can reach out to Amber Summers Graham. Her uh, contact information is all the way at the very top of the chat probably at this point um, but go ahead and, and get that email address and make sure you get a copy of the recording if you'd like to have it on hand for later or share with a colleague um, or someone else who wasn't able to make it tonight happy to share that information uh, around the state so thank you all so much thank you to our wonderful audience for for engaging so beautifully in the chat and such great questions and just giving us your time this evening um, we hope it was uh, beneficial for you and we hope you learned a lot and um, that's all I have so thank you all so much and have a great rest of your e evening. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having everybody. me.